Would you stand with me? I want to thank all of you for your kindness, for your participation in our special services. I know they were a little longer than normal, and uh, we went late Thursday night as we celebrated the ordination. But I want to thank you for all the hard work, all the beautiful food, and all the card gifts, kind words that were said. Uh, it means a lot. I appreciate your support. And obviously, I couldn't be a bishop if you weren't following me where we were going. So thank you for your kindness and for everything that you've said and done. Uh, my wife and I, are if we're looking a little tired, it's because if I look, I look back at the last five weeks, and we had a back-to-school rally, and then we had a, a district board meeting, and then we went to Windsor Locks and helped install the pastor there, and then we had general conference for a week, and then we came back to Thompson together, and then my... We were both sick for a couple days, and then I had three meetings with church boards over the last few weeks, and then Brother Wright came, and we obviously hosted them. And then last night, we went to Danielson and installed Brother Rosado as pastor. And this Thursday and Friday, we'll be in upstate New York at a roundtable conference, and the next week will be New England Revival Conference. And that Saturday, we'll be at the marriage retreat teaching, and then then I'm going to be preaching in Southington. Then there'll be the Spanish rally and holidays are going to be a, a relaxing time. <laughs> but that's just, uh, I'm saying that to underscore what Brother Wright said. The more God uses us other places, the more people here cover the bases. So if you're in the hospital, it's probably going to be an elder or deacon that comes to pray for you. They're just as valid as I am and God's healed. Uh, I mean, a good example we just used recently is... Uh, when the Blaisdells went to the rehab center and prayed for Tracy, she received the Holy Ghost after they left. God's able to use us as a body that way. Uh, and so I want to read a passage of scripture today, and then I want to hear from you. I'm not going to preach today. You're going to preach. And this is the concept we are the body of Christ. Brother Wright mentioned that. He is the head. You know, as a, as a bishop, I may be in the neck somewhere or in the spinal cord because I help to or organize other people. But uh, you may be a hand. And anybody here would probably agree with me that hands are important. Uh, and so you're important. When I go on vacation, my whole body goes on vacation. When I go to sleep, my whole body goes to sleep, hopefully. I mean, when it doesn't, I don't get to sleep. You know, when my leg is hurting and it's not letting me rest, my whole body suffers. So when God tries to take a church somewhere, the whole body needs to go there can't just be the pastor going to this new dimension that God is saying we're going to of the supernatural. And that's why Brother Wright, uh, I was a little surprised that uh, some of the things he dealt with, I, I thought he would be teaching Wednesday night more about deacons and elders. But I believe God just led him to, to remind you that you're going to be laying hands on the sick. It's not really about your title. It's about everybody in this room having a ministry. It's about everybody in this room being a witness. And so I'm wondering, are you, are you going with me? Uh, will we have to leave a, a leg behind? Uh, will we be missing two eyes on the way where we're going? Or are you as a body going with us into this new place? Because it's not, even though we celebrated my ordination, God is ordaining this entire body to go somewhere. So I'm going to read the the chapter in Romans about the body from the message paraphrase in just a minute. And I'd like you to think about it. But then I'm going to ask you, I'm going to have open mic, and I'm going to ask you to come and share some things. So I want to tell you what I'd like you to think about sharing before I read. So while I'm reading, you can be thinking maybe about both. I like, for, I like to hear from my ideas to hear from 15 of you or so. Not just the elders and not just uh, the people who are quick, or, or, uh, I guess, bold or have a talkative personality. I'm interested in, you know, some of you that are kidneys, you know, we never hear from. 
Some of you that uh, you're an important part of the body, you have great faith, but you don't often say it out loud so other people don't even know you have that faith. God may have given you a dream last week, but you've no, never shared it with anybody. You may have seen an angel, but you didn't tell anybody, so they don't know that. So I, I'm looking for some of you to share. Maybe last week, Brother Wright said within the next three days, God was going to give people opportunities to witness. Maybe two or three of you had an opportunity to witness in the last week, and we need to hear that. There may be some people here that have uh, had had maybe understanding or maybe you had an experience in the Thursday night or Wednesday night service. Maybe you uh, maybe you've been given rejuvenation. We need to hear that you're excited about where God has taken this. What are you expecting? What are you believing God for? Or maybe it even has to do with what God's been teaching us. Is you, you noticed, I'm sure, uh, when Brother Wright gave me the charge he mentioned confidence and joy and peace and everything I've been preaching for the last month. So what's God been telling you about confidence? What has been God, what, what's God been building in you about trust? Now, here's the only challenge. Uh, once you figure out what you want to say, you need to say it succinctly. So if you can think about what you want to say, I'd like to hear from 15 or 20 of you. Uh, and if each of you took a minute, you know, or, or two, we, we, would only, we would be out by noon. If everybody takes three or four minutes, uh, we'll just go right into our six, six o'clock service right after that. <laughs> Let's pray and ask God to have his way as you minister today. God, I pray that you would give unction. I pray that you would help people in this room to realize that you are giving them faith. You are wanting to speak through them. You are wanting to share that faith to others through them. I pray that in the next few minutes you would allow us to hear what you are saying to the church. And you would allow faith to be shared. And you would allow the things that have been happening in our lives to be shared. That you would help everyone in this room to feel the faith and to go together as a body where you're taking us. In Jesus' name, you may be seated as I read Romans 12. I'm going to read it without any uh, commentary because it's kind of self-explanatory. <clears throat> I'd like you to especially notice when we get to verse 4 in uh, kind of the middle of this section. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Isn't that interesting, Brother Zonia? Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you do not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No. God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. In this way, we're like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as part of the body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioned bodies, parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be. Without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. Doesn't that all sound familiar? If you preach, just preach. God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help. Don't take over. If you teach, 
Stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open and be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who, deeply lo who love deeply. Practice plain sick second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled in a flame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if she's thirsty, if he's thirsty, give him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Lots of good advice. I want to know what God is saying to you and how we'll do this. Is I'd like you, if you'd like to say something, to come stand right over here. And i like the person speaking just to take the center. They'll have the mic. And when they're done, they can just hand it off to the person there. I'd like my wife, if she would, to go back to the piano because I may have us do a little worship so we can chew and swallow part way through depending on how things flow here but uh, I like there to be two or three people here at all times until we get to the end of things so uh, if if you see this we're down to one or two people in the batter's box and you want to say something if you'll just if you're over there just come around the back and, and come stand over here and then <clears throat> as you say what you need to say if you can say it like I said in two or three minutes then just pass it off to the next person, and we're just going to let, we're going to listen to what the Holy Ghost is saying through one another. And I, I'll say what I've said before, I probably don't have to say this, but we're not besting one another, we're not trying to be super spiritual, we don't need to, you know, you don't need to get up here and say you saw an angel if you didn't see an angel, we're not looking for you to wow us, you're just who you are. I, I really don't want my hand to chew my food. I want my mouth to chew my food, right? So uh, if, if God hasn't given you a gift of, say, prophecy, well, then don't get up here and prophesy. You don't need to prophesy. You don't need, you know, may, may seem neat when brother so-and-so prophesies. Well, maybe that's his gift, and that's not your gift. We don't need you to do what the mouth does. We need you to do what the hand does, if you're the hand. If you're the heart, we really don't want you to breathe for us. Because if the heart were breathing, it wouldn't be pumping blood and we would die. So you need to be who you are. So what I'm looking for is for you just to come up here and be as transparent as you can be about who you are. And share what God is saying to you and what you're thinking. And any expectation that you have, any insights that you have. And again, just be as succinct as possible. So can you come, uh, two or three of you come stand right here so I know uh, at least there'll be two or three of us saying something, even while I'm introducing here. Uh, and uh, again, you don't have to have a great revelation, but what's probably going to happen this morning is as you hear other people talking, it's going to remind you of some things. Uh, maybe you were praying and God spoke something to you. And all you need to get up here to do today is say, you know, I was praying last Friday morning and uh, I was wrestling with this and God said this and this and this. And so I learned something and then go sit down. And and by the time we get done, there's going to be a sermon preached here. And God's going to help us as a body to know we're all going somewhere. This isn't about a program and it's not about your your bishop going there by himself. It's everybody going there. Right. So. Uh, I like us to begin, as I give the mic to Brother Ford, by giving God one more great round of applause for 
what he's doing in the entire body of Christ. Would you praise him one time as we begin? Wednesday night, uh, Brother Wright said that within the next three days, you'd be able to witness to somebody. So Thursday, I had an opportunity to, um, I had a meeting with uh, an elder, a missionary, and I don't know, I'm assuming the other guy was a bishop of a, um, of a church, and uh, it was a Mormon church. And, uh, you know, they were trying to convert me, and I was interested in just handing truth. So um, God opened up that door, and, and it happened. So I just walked into it. I didn't do anything great there. I just handed them whatever God gave me. So, uh, We all know that we're in a spiritual battle. And uh, I believe it was Wednesday night, Brother Wright had alluded to uh, Moses and how during the battle Moses held uh, staff up and when he did that they were having victory and as soon as his arm would, would let down they would start to lose and it kind of uh, when Brother Hansen after he was ordained bishop by Brother Wright I remember him coming up to the front maybe this was Thursday this, this happened but uh, Brother Hansen came to the front and he raised his hand and I felt like it was representative of the same type of situation that happened with Moses. Well, Brother Hansen has his hands over this congregation. I believe that we're going to have victory. And it just reminded me of how much more we need to come behind him and hold up his arms with prayer. And, to, uh, and, and to, while he's weak, like he said, he's very busy and, ha and gets tired. We need to come behind him and, and lift up his arms and make sure that we're continuing to have victory and we're able to continue to see the things that God has blessed us with. Uh, two things quickly. That New England Revival service that's going to be in Auburn, it's going to be at a Baptist church. And the week after we, Brother Hanson handed them flyers out, I felt the Lord prompt me to send an invitation to the pastor of the Tri-State Baptist Church, the new church on 131, or the new building. So I mailed it to him this week. And we'll see what God does with it. I figured if it's going to be at a Baptist church, maybe he'll come and you know, it's kind of like a stealth operation here or something. But, but then the whole thing about, again, what Brother Wright said on uh, Wednesday night, that God would open up an opportunity in the next three days. Honestly, I forgot that he even said that until the opportunity came last night, which is three days from Wednesday. I'm replacing the front door in my house, so I took the old one off, and I had it leaning up against the house. And... Next thing I know, this white pickup truck pulls in the driveway, and the guy gets out and starts walking up to me. I, I have no idea who he is. But he was interested in the old door. So we were chatting and stuff. And long story short, he ended up, well, first of all, he gave me a brand new LED flashlight. He said, I just like to give these as gifts to nice people. And then, and then, uh, and then he gave me a, a Jehovah Witness tract. And he's a, J, a Jehovah Witness. So I let him talk for a couple of minutes. I said, that's really interesting. I said, because I'm, I'm an elder and a minister at, at Acts 2 Ministries right down the street here. And I told him all about the Holy Ghost, how I got filled with the Holy Ghost, how, how I got baptized in Jesus' name, and how we're doing that on a regular basis here. And, and God's going to be doing it more and more. And he just kind of silently stood there. <laughs> and he said, well, the answers on this flyer are going to be different than what you think, than what you believe. I said, yeah, I know, I've talked to other Jehovah Witnesses before, but I said, God's filling people with the Holy Ghost, and we're baptizing them in Jesus' name. I said, we're called Acts 2 Ministries because we're a continuation of the Book of Acts Church. And then he just, he went away. He walked away. <laughs> <laughs> this might be a little different than what all the rest of them have been saying, but I'm going to tell you the life of a sinner of a man and a child. The child was born. He was born free. He had no evil in him. As he went to school, darkness started falling on him. He became corrupted, dark, mean, drinking, drugs. He started hating people. 
he, he put up a wall, and he could never understand what he was doing, why he was doing this. Till one night, in 1977, got into a very bad car crash. By all medical terms, everything known to mankind, this person should have been dead. He had a steering column right through him. His face was just about tore off. His skull on one side was busted. This man should not have been alive. They got him out of the car, and they brought him to the hospital. His parents said, you know, please, Lord, save him. The doctor said, nothing we can do about it. He's going to die. This person laid in bed for three days. So finally, another doctor said, get him dressed, get him ready. He's going to Boston. He needs medical, you know. So they rushed this person to Boston. He died three times on the way. The third time, they rushed him into a hospital. The New England Deaconess, where it was supposed to be been the best kidney hospital around. Just so happened that day that there was a very famous doctor, Dr. Dowd, who was one of the leading doctors in the country, probably in Europe, probably in the world. He came in to the emergency room and saw this person. He immediately said, prep him from surgery. But this person had a very unique kidney. It was a horseshoe kidney. It could never be separated. This person was either going to lose his kidneys and live the rest of his life on dialysis or not live at all. This operation that he did had never been performed. Never, ever. He took the horseshoe kidney, which never been separated before, and he separated it. 144 days later, this person walked out of the hospital after three major surgeries. Well, that night that he had hit those trees, he had saw a light. He had died. He had actually felt himself lifting out of his body. And he had saw this light. He went to that light. And his grandfather said, no, not now. Go back. People were crying. And he heard those cries. The next thing you know, he went back into his body. He felt all the pain and everything else. He woke up, like I said, uh, in the hospital three weeks later, went through the operations and everything else. But for 38 years, he could never understand what was happening to him. He knew there was something missing. He knew there was something that he had to do. He just couldn't do it. As the years went by, he stopped smoking. Years later, he stopped drinking. He started changing, but he never could understand why he was changing. Never. He felt something was wrong, something needed, something was missing. I'm sorry I've taken long, but I think this is important. I mean, it's, it's, but anyway, as time went on, he grew stronger. He still could never figure out what he was doing. Till one day he met this person, quite by chance, don't know why, but this person came into his life. He started talking with him. He started helping him. He started giving him information that started making him question things. And he questioned them, and he questioned them, and he questioned them. And every time this person would come back to him, he would find different answers. But he was always left with different questions. Till finally, one day this person went back to his old ways. He was mean, took tantrums, tore the house up, you know? Loved his wife, but was causing her pain. He was, a, he was a wild lunatic. He was a maniac. Almost reached for the bottle again. But he left the house and he went for a, for a ride. He stopped. The next morning, 
he met this person again and said, I can't do this by myself. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I finally found my answer. I'm ready. That Sunday, <coughs> this person <coughs> was baptized. He received the Holy Spirit. His life changed immediately. Immediately. He found his answers. And today, I'm standing right before you. And I can tell you right now that miracles happen. People change. But you can't do it by yourself. It took me 38 years to figure it out. But only Jesus can help you. If you let him. I just thought that might have been something you might have wanted to hear and share with you. But it may take 38 years for a miracle to happen. But you're looking at a miracle. A walking miracle. And I can testify that all my life to that one day that I was born. I, I, I equate it as I had three lives. One, I was born innocent. The second life, I turned into the meanest, rottenest person you can imagine. And then the third life is the life I'm living right now. Praise God, and I thank you, Lord. As Bishop was reading that passage, I was reminded that as many of my stories are, I spent eight years giving my summers to a Boy Scout summer camp. Um, and many of you know I would just disappear for the entire summer. And everyone, where's Scott? Um, but we would always, like, it, for a few years, we'd always have these call and responses. And as staff, I was there for five weeks and so we'd hear it every single week so I could probably tell you every single one but one always stuck out to me because it was like a lot of them were, were goofy like uh, you know you would say like just hang loose just have fun yeah um, but the one that stung out stuck out to me that was was when we had a theme of leadership and the leadership one was uh, the person would the person that started it would say inspired to lead and then everyone else would respond dedicated to serve and it was that idea that you uh the, the idea behind it is that if you want to be a leader then serve you can't be a leader without you know being also serving the people underneath you it was it just reminded me a lot of of that stuff and also another story Probably my favorite character in literature was, um, it's the bishop at the beginning of, of Les Miserables, where um, it talks a lot about him, because if you ever read Les Miserables, he got paid by the word, so he wrote a whole lot. Um, and But the bishop comes up, and he comes up through, he starts off as a priest, he goes through his whole story, and then he meets up with this criminal that can't find anywhere to go, Jean Valjean. Um, and he invites him into his house and feeds him and gives him a place to stay. And during the night, um, John Valjean steals all his silverware and runs away. And then, um, so the police catch him and they bring him back and say, we, we have him, he has all his silverware. And the bishop looks at him and goes, why didn't you take the candlesticks? I told you to take the candlesticks too. And like, it just struck me in the end of like that, like people that do evil to you, you know, you need to do, if you do the opposite to them, sometimes it can change their life. Like the rest of that story is just how John Valjean just changed his stars. He went from being, you know, a condemned criminal, ended up having to change his identity. And then like how he impacted people's lives and helped people and became this good person. So it's just... That whole idea that we, if you want something to happen, sometimes you have to do the opposite of what you think you need to do. If you want to lead, you need to serve. If you want you know, to see justice done, sometimes you have to forgive or you know, do good to that person that wronged you. So, yeah. First of all, I just want to say how appreciative I am to the Lord for 
having come to the, uh, the two nights with Brother Wright and seeing the Bishop ordained, and uh, that was just awesome. That was just truly an awesome experience for me. Um, it was very humbling to be in the presence of a man of God, such a powerful filling of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Uh, it's just his words still resonate with me. Um, it just, I sum it up like this, uh, to walk, you know, to, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, and to love others as I love myself, having the fruits of the Holy Spirit be evident in my life, and following the leading of the Holy Spirit, putting God first and others first. And that sums it up for me right there. As many of you know, I was one of those people that were born and raised in church. I was spoken to in my heart by Jesus when I was about nine years old, and he challenged me. He said, I want you to make a choice. Either serve me or find some other avenue to go down the road. So I said, okay, Lord, I'll serve you. I had no problem with that. And when I committed to him that way, he said, someday you will teach and preach my word. Well, many years went by, and I tried. I honestly tried to teach his word to different people along the way throughout the years. I just couldn't do it, and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't do it. After a series of uh, being in different churches for a short time with Sueli, uh, the Lord finally brought us here. And after about being here for about a year, uh, I was not figuring out why I wasn't teaching and preaching God's word. And then one morning up here, Dennis Paul's guy was sitting up here and I don't remember what he was doing up here, but he get up here and he says, as the oldest member of the school of ministry, I get to go first. And that stunned me. And I was sitting right over here and that just stunned me. I'm like, I was like, I didn't hear a word the rest of the sermon the rest of that morning. I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. He's older than I am. He's in the school of ministry? My impression was, with all the young people that were sitting over here, that it was for the young men in their 20s, because it was school. Well, I spoke to Bishop Hanson later on, and he informed me what the school ministry really was, and he chose to accept me into it. And that brought me to reading a book by Brother Bernard called The Oneness of God. And that's when, I realized, that's when I learned that this thing that the Baptists call Trinity, my viewpoint is a lie, straight out lie. And the Bible actually teaches something called the oneness of God. And when I learned that, I'm going, the light bulb went on in my head. I'm going, oh, the Bible finally makes sense to me. No wonder I couldn't teach it. And then Bishop Hanson was we just enough to put me into a teaching position, and I'm still learning, but God is gracious, and he's helped me to continue on that path. My name is Bert, for those who don't know me. And uh, I spent the first uh, 40 years of my life in a, in a different uh, way than maybe most of you, but uh, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in Brooklyn. And so by the time I was 19 years old, I decided I didn't, I knew the things I didn't want to be. And that was a dairy farmer. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff you pick up in your hands and throw around and, uh, and I didn't want any more to do with that stuff, although I get plenty of it sometimes. <clears throat> But now I spend the next 20 years in the military. And uh, you always, you're always looking for something else in this world. Some, maybe something better or uh, something more challenging. 
but I thought the military was my that was one of my greatest accomplishments. <coughs> but uh, and it was it was it was a structured living. You didn't have to make too many decisions. They, they were more or less made for you. But uh, I, I spent uh, uh, six years as an aircraft mechanic. Flew on these things because they they really didn't want you. Uh, except an airplane from you that you wouldn't fly in yourself. So, uh, so anyway, I flew with them. And, uh, and then I was uh, put in a position of uh, uh, going to ICBMs. Anybody doesn't know what ICBM is? That's an intercontinental ballistic missile. And, uh, and I was on a launch crew for that. And two officers and three enlisted people. Quite a combination, you come right down to it. Uh, but we all lived together to get this thing off the ground safely and, uh, and successfully. And we did. <clears throat> but then uh, I spent the rest of my 20 years in and out of ballistic missiles. And coming out, I was completely lost. Because when I went to the unemployment office, uh, they could not cross-reference my job into any civilian job. There was none. So I collected unemployment. And uh, <clears throat> I even told them I didn't want to collect un unemployment. I wanted to retire. And they said, no, that's not the law. You have to collect unemployment. So I did. Then I, <clears throat> I had, so anyway, I had various jobs. And uh, by the way, I was born and raised in a congregational church in, uh, in Danielson. And, but, but for about 20 years, I uh, would uh, seek something else. I wasn't getting the message I wanted to receive. And uh, <clears throat> so we'd go from church to church to church and it still wasn't receiving anything. And uh, until we uh, finally uh, came to this one. Don't know what led us here, it's too far away from anything. It's out, out, out in the middle of the, the, the sticks here. <coughs> I, have a, I can basically say this is in the sticks because I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Brooklyn. That's out in the sticks. But anyway, uh, and then I, I met my wife uh, before that, and uh, we, got, we got married. And uh, she's a Pentecost, been a Pentecost of all our life. So you take, a, you take a, someone from a congregational church to married a Pentecostal in all her life, you're going to have a few challenges, <laughs> which we've had. But my son went in the Air Force after I did. He's in the Air Force now. He's up in a place that I left 40 years ago, which is the Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. You can't get any farther up in the north of us than still be in the United States. <clears throat> and, uh, but he's up there. And then he got, came back from Germany. And he got reassigned from Germany to North Dakota. He always wondered what hell looks like. Sometimes that's what it is. <clears throat> so anyway, he's in, a, he's in a good place. And we went up to see him this summer. I, I vowed I'd never go to this God-forsaken place again. But I did. I went up there to see my son, our son. And uh, he, he's doing well in, at Grand Forks, North Dakota. <clears throat> so anyway... Uh, we, uh, wife and I, was looking for a place to be. We went to several Pentecostal churches, and uh, it was, they all seemed to be missing something. And uh, so uh, now we've come to this one. And, uh, and it's the Lord that led us here. So. I want you to think for a minute about two disciples. One of them is John. He wrote the book of John, the book of Revelation, a couple others. And he leaned on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. Um, he speaks about love, 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 love. Then there's Peter. And can anybody tell me one thing about Peter? Anything he did? Love. What? Walked on water. Yeah. Cut the ear off. Ah, that's what I was looking for. P 
Peter cut the ear of the servant of the high priest off in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter was not John, and John was not Peter. Their personalities were like night and day. Peter couldn't do what John did. John could not do what Peter did. And so now I'll be me, okay? You're not getting Brother Wright right now. This is Susan. But I'm, uh, I think I'm needed in the world somewhere along the line, just like you are. Um, the Lord was talking to me about a couple of things. I'm all into gardening lately. That does not make me a great gardener. It means I'm learning how to garden. One of the things I was reading about was pruning. Um, I'm going to write on that one of these days because it's, I told Dennis, I said, that'll preach, honey. But um, uh, when you prune a tree, you really don't, the weak trees don't need pruning so much. It's the stronger trees that need pruning. And it isn't even the weak branches on the strong trees that need pruning. It's the most fruit-bearing branches that they prune off of the trees. So it's like, okay, that's probably the opposite of what I would have done. I probably would have killed a tree or something. But I surely wouldn't have not made, I wouldn't have made it more fruitful. But when God does pruning, you still have to have confidence inside of you that who you are is valid. Just because God cuts the tree does not mean the tree is no good. A no good tree, he uproots and throws out of the garden. He hasn't done that to anybody here that I know of. He won't. As long as you want him to work on you, he's going to work on you. But when the pruning time comes, and I hope this isn't the Lord warning me, but anyways, he said to me, <laughs> when the pruning time comes, just remember that I'm, I love this tree. I'm working on this tree. I'm not trying to make this tree be a different tree. I'm just trying to make it bring forth more of the fruit it brings forth. So I guess God just wants you to um, have confidence that who you are is extremely valid, exactly who you are. A tree starts off as a little seed. It's not the mighty oak until it grows for years and years and years and years. What did Brother uh, Wright allude to about something that took years to happen? I forgot what it was. Maybe the dry bones things. But anyways... That's enough. <laughs> About four or five years ago, um, we started getting these uh, brambles in uh, places in the yard, and they produce uh, these uh, black caps, which is just a little kind of rounded little berry thing. And um, <clears throat> as I would go out and kind of pick those and uh, observe them, one thing I found out is that the... Uh, the, they call them black caps because if they're not black, they're not ready to come off. And uh, Brother Wright, uh, I believe, was talked about that uh, some years ago about uh, being able to pick fruit when it's ripe. And um, you can pull them off before they're, you know, when they're like a real dark, uh, a real dark uh, purple. And uh, you can pull them off when they got a little red in them. And the less black they are, the harder they are to come off. And uh, when they are just completely black, you know, it's just like it's you just kind of hit it, you know, a little bit and come right off in your hand. Um, <clears throat> and I was thinking about that in uh, the context of what I'm about to say. I was at a, um, uh, a foreign language teacher's uh, conference this uh, last few days. And there was a fellow that I, uh, we were actually going to ride up together, uh, but uh, that didn't work out. Uh, so... Finally, I, I, I'd only known him through, um, you know, uh, email type stuff, and I um, had a chance. It was just the two of us in this uh, uh, Super 8 motel, and so, you know, we spent a few hours uh, together after uh, we got a bite to eat, and he is, has this chance to go from, he's a Latin teacher, but there's this opportunity. He doesn't have, like, that kind of a job right now, so to be a Spanish teacher, but he doesn't speak Spanish, so, <laughs> but he knows how to teach. Um, and see, he said that somebody had said to him that, um, he said it was kind of weird, he said uh, this uh, teacher out in Colorado suggested that, she, that he just, uh, you know, start listening to the Bible in Spanish. And it was kind of like he was a little derogatory about it. And uh, we kind of got back around to that. And I said, well, you know what you said about the Bible thing? I said that my wife did that for uh, um, maybe a year or more. And she has a uh, bilingual Bible. 
So she reads through it in Spanish on the left side of the page, and then on the right column, uh, that she'd just check over there and see if, you know, whenever she'd check over there whenever she didn't understand it. I said, so, you know, I've really seen improvement in um, uh, her understanding. And um, so, you know, it wasn't much. It didn't lead to anything else. He wasn't ready for anything else, and that's where I left it. There was another uh, friend that I uh, uh, met him in January, and um, he lost his job. Uh, I uh, sent him some possibilities, some leads that I uh, uh, found, and he ended up getting something else. So, you know, he's, he's back employed. Anyway, we, we spent, um, you know, had a number of uh, possibilities to kind of talk. Uh, uh, yesterday when we left, I said, um, it, it just kind of come to me just so naturally, but it's like, you know, you can kind of lower your voice, raise your voice, you can do other things. And, <laughs> and so I, I just said, God bless you. And uh, he kind of surprised me. He said, he's kind of a more boisterous person. He said, God bless you too. And... Um, I don't know where that's going to go. I don't know what it was, but I just felt like it just came out so naturally. It was so not something I was planning to say. And so we'll, we'll see what happens with the little things God gives us. Just to, just to let some of this settle in, uh, but we have three people waiting. I, I'd like to challenge maybe three more women. So we'll have six more people say something, but we've heard mostly from men, but... Uh, if you could get ready to follow Nathan, three more women, that'll be uh, our, our whole lineup today. All right, let's sing this song and just let it. And I will give praises to the King, lift my voice and sing to the only wise God, worthy of glory and Let's praise him. Well, most of you, so quite a few of you know me. I'm Joe. Um, when I moved in with my mom last year, um, one thing that came to my mind um, with, since I've met, moved there is I had a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Um, but all I did really was just kind of bottle it up, shove it down, because I don't know how to deal with it. You know, it's years of anger, years of um, tears. And I'm a type of, I'm an imaginative kind of person where I use my mind a lot. I like to use my mind. It, um, I love challenges to a point. Um, one day I doing my usual routines and then all of a sudden a scenario played in my head. It was never in that scenario. I never experienced that scenario. But it's just, it had to do with someone that has hurt me and I, that um, I was bothered it up and, but I recognized what the background meaning of it was. The, um, so um, I talked with pastor well, Bishop, <laughs> talked to Bishop, and um, and he came to figure out that I needed to forgive people in my life that has hurt me. But it was, I'm a like a lot of people. I'm a creature of habit. It's hard for me to break, um, learn a new trick sometimes. So I just 
I listened to the audio CD series that uh, um the book that um Bishop Hansen um suggested to me and everything that Andy Smith said in that um I uh, um in that book it was like I, 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 it almost seemed like I kind of experienced some of that too um it's like some discomfort some um pain but it eventually it went away i want and also it's like it, it it's just too amazing to and god continues to work on me for some things and it's like when brother jonathan robitas came here and preached last year like he was praying for people and stuff i was in the line to be prayed for. I, before coming to this church, coming back to living with my mom, I've had depression issues. I was technically diagnosed in 2009 on New Year's Day. And I just had a rough time dealing with my emotions, dealing with life. And I've had serious ups and downs. And I stand here before you with um not having to need to take the meds because god has delivered me from that last year when last year and i can tell you i may not be able to forget everything that has happened to me or anything that um people have done towards me or anything like that but i've learned that one thing at least that God, oh, is that God will take away the hurt, he'll heal and mend our hearts, but the memories may still be there so that we may be able to help, um, help those in similar situations. Um, was the first time in person that I had potential here, brother, right? And for me, these two days here was like reset. Reset or remind us things which you have learned from the word, and many times myself do not put in practice. One of the things he was saying about the level of authority is things, things which I always have to remind that I have a people over me, my husband, the head of the house, and things like this because in the kingdom of God, everything has a balance and order. And this is for me was the other things like um, each of us has different gifts. And I don't need to be afraid because I am so early. God has given to me what I need to do. Each of us have something to do. And I cannot be Becky and Becky cannot be me. I cannot be Sister Handsome and she cannot be me. And we don't need to compete with one another. This is also for me a good reminder that that's that is not uh, that I'm competing with the people, but as a, because we are in this flesh, sometimes we, the flesh, want to raise up and do things which God didn't call us to do. And for me, it was a good reminder, and I praise God for it. I believe God is, wants to reach this uh, community, and I believe he's doing a, a lot of work. Uh, Tim brought up a, a situation with um, Tri-State Baptist Church, and I went over there uh, this week and uh, I met with the pastor and everything. And, uh, you know, just to say, because I heard some of his sermons and uh, he had some positive stuff, so I just, you know, told him that. And he also had missionaries with him. Um, and then I listened to another sermon. They were reading the pastor's uh, uh, article in a, in a paper. So, you know, I believe God is, is reaching this community. And I believe this, uh, that this truth is going to be released all over. Amen. This is so encouraging today because 
things are happening. I had no idea what's happening. And I mean, incredible. I wasn't expecting to hear incredible stories about lives that have been completely changed. And it caused me to, to remember there's a saying in French, and the saying is creme de la creme. Say that with me. Creme de la creme. Creme de la creme. That means the cream of the cream. In America, we talk about the cream of the crop. It's the best of the crop, maybe the best 10%. But in France, they like to talk about not just the cream of the crop, but the cream of the cream of the crop. And I'm looking at the creme de la creme today. The book of Philippians says uh, that Paul, Paul said that I have no confidence in the flesh. And you're not the creme de la creme because you've got the most accomplishments or the, the most pedigree or the best resume. But because lives have been changed, have been given to God. And th these stories that were blowing my mind about people for some reason coming to this church and finding truth and their lives completely changed in the flesh being destroyed, the flesh, because the problem, the problem with the flesh, with having confidence in the flesh, is if you've accomplished a lot, if you're a really good singer, you can put your confidence in that, and you have to get over that, but if you're not a really good singer, you cannot have confidence at all because you want something to put it in. But when you get to the point where I think God is trying to take us, where I have no confidence in the flesh, what I did yesterday doesn't at all affect what I'm doing today right now. I need God right now just as much as I did yesterday. And so God's doing all these incredible things in people's lives. And Brother Wright said something that just really resonated with me. He said, when the leader is elevated, and I think we were, everyone that was here witnessed Brother Hanson being spiritually elevated, it creates a vacuum. So there's actually, a, a vacuum is actually an upward force. There's actually something, it's like anti-gravity. There's something that's trying to pull the rest of us up. It's not just an empty space, but it's actually, there's something spiritually that's trying to lift each one of you up. And the thing about the cream is it rises to the top. And we're not rising to the top because we're talented. We're not rising to the, the secular success top. We're not rising to the, the top like an inspirational speaker would tell you you're going to rise to the top. But we're being elevated spiritually in God, which means there's less flesh. There might be less uh, pats on the back. There might be less accolades. You guys are the creme de la creme. You're the best of the best. And it's so much, it's such an honor just to to be in God's presence with God's people here at this awesome church that God is using to reach Baptist churches. He's using to reach the needy. He's using to change lives. People that for decades have wrestled with, with that missing thing. Those people are all around us. These towns are full of people with similar stories to what we've heard today. And God is using us to completely change this region. And it's so exciting. It's so much fun to be a part of. So um, I first just want to share a little testimony. Um, God recently blessed me with a new job. As many of you know, I was working about an hour away from home, driving to and from every day, and it was very stressful and um, lots of gas money. And But uh, this week I just started a new job close to home in Worcester, and I didn't even really put in an application for the job. It was a really weird situation where they contacted me and asked me to give them my resume and ask me to come in for an interview and then two days later after the interview they wanted to hire me so I started this week and um, in my old job people didn't talk about God they didn't talk about religion they didn't want to hear about it they didn't it was hush hush if you said it, they got awkward and they would walk away and so I was just kind of used to that situation where no one talks about God or church or any of anything that had to do with religion, really. And um, so I'm, I'm sitting at my desk working, and one of my coworkers works in, and she's doing something, and we just got to talking about things that are going on in our lives, and I mentioned something about my mom having a baby and being in the hospital, and, and she's like, yeah, well, you just need to pray for her. Everything's going to be okay. You just need to pray to God about that. And I was like, what? Did you just say pray, like God? And I didn't even say anything about that. She approached me, and it reminded me 
I had forgotten Brother Wright said that there was going to be someone who would open the door and you would be able to step through and talk to them about God. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And for me, it was just such a, a small thing, but a huge reminder that we are in revival and God is opening people's hearts and God is doing things even though we can't see it or we feel like, oh, I'm just on the sidelines or I don't understand all this stuff that's going on or oh, it's going to be Bishop Hanson or the elders going to experience all these things because they're so outgoing and good at witnessing. But it was just a gentle reminder of God saying, no, I'm putting you in this harvest field and you're going to play your part and I'm doing this thing here in New England and everyone has their role to play. Hello. See if we can do this and keep one of us asleep. Um, I wasn't able to make it to either of Brother Wright's services, so I didn't know about that thing about being able to witness within the next three days. Um, on this past Monday, my husband went out to uh, Sarah and Kenny's house to cut down some trees and got to meet them. And it wasn't Monday night. I don't think it was Tuesday night. I'm pretty sure it was Wednesday night, which would be the beginning, which is so cool. Um, he started, we started talking about Kenny and everything that's been going on with him. My husband is not saved, and over the years, um, he's been more and more open to, you know, asking different questions about things, and, you know, what is the Trinity anyway, and what is the oneness anyway, and, and all that. But the one thing he's always been um, not open to discussing is, is his opinion that Christians really get the worst in life that it's not anybody else who has all these horrible things happen. It's all the Christians. And he said, I can name all these different people I've worked with who were good people who would say, I'll pray for you. And, and this lady lost her son. And this guy lost his job and his house and his got a car accident all in one month. And this guy did this. And, and so it was really neat for me. We talked about it, and he was the one who brought it up. And he said, you know, I just don't understand. And this time he was really asking about Kenny and just saying, I just, it just really seems like, why is it the Christians who always have this happen? And he wasn't cocky about it and he was really asking and he really wanted to know, finally. And I was able to talk to him about um, years ago when something was wrong with his heart and he was in the hospital and I said, you know, when I drove to the hospital and I was alone, nobody was there for me, even you, but God was there. And I got to learn how tough God is, how strong he is, and how I respected God on a whole new level after that, when he was there for me like no one else could be. And I got to talk to him about Peter, our oldest son, who was diagnosed with moderate to severe autism, who was totally nonverbal, and how God healed him. But th th you have, I can't even, I don't have enough time in my two-minute allotment here to explain all the things that God did, but I never trusted God like I did before until I could finally give him my son. I never trusted him, I, I, and I was able to tell him those things. I, he didn't know that his, I said, I'm a good Christian. I don't, you know, I dress modestly, and I don't swear, and I don't drink, and I'm kind, and I'm generous. And I said, but when our son was diagnosed with a disease that the doctor said has no cause and no cure, I didn't trust him with my son because he heals some people and not others. And it took me years to say, I don't care when you heal him, I just trust you, and, and no matter what. And he didn't know those things, and it, it really, you know how you can feel when you witness to somebody and there's either a wall or there's not? There was no wall. It, God did something so awesome. I've just been sitting here thinking that um, <clears throat> the last few months uh, I've been so frustrated <laughs> and um, finally God came along and said that's not frustration that's hunger and it, it, it feels so much the same you know it's hard to tell sometimes but God has been giving me hunger and so um, I guess I didn't connect it in my mind that the hunger was leading to where God is taking us. 
and, and now, so now it makes sense, kind of, duh, but anyway, um, I guess I just felt like sharing with you, if, if that happens in your life, if you just start feeling like you're frustrated or like your prayers are not going anywhere and you don't feel like you're doing anything for God, it's just like this whole big frustration. Everything in life is a frustration. You might consider that God is just getting you hungry. You know, and if he doesn't get us hungry, why would we reach out to anyone else? Or why would we seek God more, try to grow in him? So that is a healthy thing, and it seems like a really bad thing because you feel like, I'm just angry all the time or just frustrated all the time. Well, maybe if you just go pray. <laughs> you know, maybe God is just trying to get you to come and be with him and so that he can put something inside of you, maybe a love for other people, we struggle with that a lot of times. If we don't love people, there's no reason for us to reach out to them. We have our own lives to live, and we have plenty to do without thinking about anyone else. But God takes us to these places so that we will get closer to him, so that we will be fruitful in the harvest. And it's a very necessary part of it. If we don't ever go there, we, we won't go to them either. So I am encouraged that God is doing awesome things in all of you. This has been wonderful for me to hear that I didn't know a lot of these stories or things that were happening. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for your support and your prayers and just being willing to be a vessel that God can use. Every one of you, God wants to use. He has a special plan for every one of you, and I appreciate you all. Man, would you stand? I want to remind you of something that I've reminded you of two or three times. That is something God's told us that, that kind of, I guess, surprised me two or three times in a row when he's told us this. And that uh, here I am over here feeling inadequate, which we're supposed to feel inadequate because it's eventually I'm supposed to rest in him, not in me. Uh, but I, I'm feeling like we got all New England to reach and we've done all these things and I only see this much progress so how in the world are we going to see all the other progress God's going to give and, and then we feel the hunger that my wife was talking about so God seems just poured on it's like God I feel like I'm not succeeding and then you make me feel even worse because I feel this hunger but what God told us several times was the things I'm going to do through you are so significant that I have to prepare you for that. And here I'm thinking, I'm inadequate, so how could anything great ever happen? And God's looking at me saying, if you ever really let me do it through you, it's just going to be so awesome. My faith is struggling to believe for these few things. And God's over there saying, I'm not worried about doing great things. I'm worried about you surviving the great things that I'm going to do through you. And, and so I hear, uh, this was well-rounded in many ways. We hear God has reached people, has changed lives. And as Nathan said, there's hundreds more out there just like that. We see that God can use us, that we are a fruitful tree, but he might be pruning us. And that's why it's so important that we get this confidence in the trust issue that was mentioned and that we love and that all these principles God has given us, that you feel good about who you are. It's important that you, you have confidence in God and in who he's made you to be so you can have the courage to step out. And so when he does great things through you, you don't take the credit for that. All of this, God is tying it all together for good. All things are working together for good. I can't connect all the dots for you, but if you're just listening this week and if you're just listening to what was said right here, there's, there's a plethora of things that are all coming together and what God is doing in you, even the frustration and even the questions and even the wrestlings, it, it, God is making us ready to go into this dimension and do what he's saying. So if you can allow your hunger or if you can allow your frustrations or if you can allow the healing that you have to go through to all help you believe, wow, this is all part of where God is taking us. It will help you to embrace life and to look forward to it and to believe God. So let's leave here encouraged. 
that God has done things and God is going to do things and everything that he's done is getting us ready for what he's going to do. And it's going to be so awesome that he wants to make sure we're saved. So he's doing deep works in us so we'll survive. Let's close by wor worshiping him, him, him in one more song. No place I'd rather Thank you for your goodness, God. No place I would I'd rather be. be. No place I would I'd rather be. be. Here in your love, here in your love, no place I would rather be, no place I would rather be, no place I would rather be, and here in your love, here in your love, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set that fire, God. Give us that hunger. Give us that desire. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Two more tidbits before I dismiss you. Uh, Wednesday night, there were a dozen people here from Danielson, from First Apostolic Church. Uh, Brother Rosado is a new pastor, and he just felt to close down their midweek service and invite everybody over here. But uh, several of them mentioned, especially the Rosados, mentioned what an impact these services had. And uh, that reminded me of what God had mentioned, that there'd be people in the, the shade of this church. Lighthouse Tabernacle, Restoration Church, First Apostolic Church. This, this, in this one week, you can see that. We're not taking credit for that, but, but it's like, keep watching. God is doing everything he said he would do. I, I just had a lady who uh, went to church in Texas with us that emailed me this morning, that, or yesterday morning, rather, that she had reprinted the article I just wrote for their bulletin down in Texas. So God is reaching the world, and God is putting people in our shadow, and, and, and we don't need to be worried about that. We just need to let God flow through us and do what he wants to do. He's a good God. You're great people. Thanks for being a part of the body. God bless you. You're dismissed.